We're going to just ask you if you don't mind introduce yourselves, those of you who are on Zoom, so we and then I'll mention something about some people we have here. Hello, okay. good evening. I'm Tom Jorgas. Hi, Tom. Hello. And I'm dog sitting, so I got to be with the dog. <laughs> okay, good for you. Next. I'm tuning in, Christine Scordis. Hey, Christine, good to see you. hear from you. Hello, Father John. Good evening, this is Lisa and Jane. Lisa and James, great. Jackie, good to see you too. <laughs> Before we start, we had a new couple that's uh, actually busy. I know that uh, George and Marie introduced themselves to tell you where they're from and why they're here. <laughs> Maria Andros, and we're from Birmingham, Alabama. Me too. Really? <laughs> What's your name? Elena. Huh? Elena. Elena. What? Lee. Oh. Okay. Lee. 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 L
Okay, we're going to start. Uh, if you're in the Orthodox Study Bible, we're on page 1368. Actually, 1369, excuse me. Uh, page 1369, the Orthodox Study Bible. And we're on uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and it's uh, verse. 21, Luke 3, 21, if you have any other Bible. And uh, we didn't finish this last week, so we're going to start out. We did get up to the baptism of Christ, and so that's where we're going to start today. And uh, we're just going to read the first two verses um, there. Michael, if you don't mind, uh, where it says Jesus is baptized, verses 21 to 22. Can't see that. Oh, okay, so good. I don't have my class. I'll understand. No problem. Sorry. Dora, go ahead. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit consented in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. You, I am well pleased. Okay, very good. You are my beloved son, and you, I am well pleased. Let's start off with a question there, right on the page A, 1A. Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. No, no. why not? He had no sin. He had no sin. Why did he submit himself to baptism? He was Jewish. He was Jewish, and therefore? All Jews have been baptized. Okay, you're going to have... They all had, all the males had to be circumcised, circumcised. yeah. So, so to the people that they have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so in other words, he was fulfilling the law. Yeah. He was fulfilling the Jewish law because it's still mentioned he was a Jewish to background. And he's going to show that everything in the Old Testament is filled, fulfilled in the New. Okay, the note down there for 321 to 22, I'm going to read. Jesus himself does not need baptism. In being baptized, our Lord accomplished several things. Now, here's a list. One, he affirmed John's ministry. Two, he was, re remember what they were asking him? Is this the one or is there someone else coming? Uh, in other words, I need to be sure about this. <coughs> Two, he was revealed by the Father and the Holy Spirit to be the Christ, what Dora just mentioned. God's beloved son. Three, he identified with his people by descending the waters with them. Four, he prefigured his own death, giving baptism its ultimate meaning. Remember when we talk about a person being baptized, their when they are baptized, they go down, and really the word for baptism means immersion. For adults, do we immerse most adults? No. no. Usually not, but now, especially in Marietta, for example, they have a beautiful walk-in baptismal pool. And so it's like this. You will walk up steps here, and here's the pool right here. The priest is able to go and go like this with the person outside the pool. And over here, you come walking down the other side. We are finally, finally in the Orthodox Church, getting to where we can have a system to baptize adults, and they can be immersed. So we've come a long way. We have a long way to go. I would say maybe 2% of the churches that are Orthodox have something like that. Now, yesterday, I was very pleased to see over at St. Stephanos, they actually had uh, George, who we had do some woodwork over there. They have a big basin, and he made a beautiful wooden thing around it. So now at least the person can go down and, 
at St. Stephanos and be baptized if, with immersion. Yeah, so, that in Cuba, and in Cuba too. I saw that. You I saw, saw it Cuba, there. Yeah. And so when a person is baptized, when you go down, you are dying with Christ. And raising, <laughs> rising with him. Yeah. All right. So that's our personal death and what? Right. Resurrection. Resurrection. Yes. After we're personated with the holy oil, chrism, that is our personal, if that was our personal Easter, the baptism or Pascha, the death and Holy Friday and, and Pascha, what is our uh, the holy chrism for us? Our personal, what these things? Pentecost. Pentecost, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So our baptism is our personal death and resurrection and receiving the Holy Chrism. We are now then receiving our personal Pentecost, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, going on to the next part. Uh, number <coughs> five, he entered the water, sanctifying the water itself. What happened after Adam and Eve sinned? What would happen to creation? It was what? It was fallen. It was tainted, fallen. In other words, that's why we have pollution now. We have death. We have sin, sin etc. So he had to make that clean again. He fulfilled six, the many types given in the Old Testament, as when Moses led the people from bondage to the Red Sea in Exodus 14, and when the Ark of the Covenant was carried into the Jordan so the people could enter the Promised Land. And seven, he opened heaven to a world separated from God through sin. We're going to talk a little about <clears throat> the icon of the baptism coming up. Let's go on to the next one, 1C. One what is the difference between the terms epiphany and theophany? What does epiphany mean? Epiphany is God is revealed. Re revelation or manifestation. Yes. Manifestation. manifestation. What does theophany mean? What's God, the difference? God, God, God revealed. God revealed. God yeah. manifested. The manifestation like the of God. All right? God revealed. Yes. Manifestation of God or uh, Epiphany Germany's manifestation. Now, what day do we celebrate Epiphany or Theophany? The sixth. The sixth of? Yeah. What date do we originally celebrate the Nativity? Yeah. 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 The sixth of January. It wasn't until about the third century, fourth century, that they separated them. In fact, if you read the church fathers, they're going to tell you that the more important one was always January 6th. It was always a manifestation of Christ. It was later, and I don't have time to go into the detail, but if you want, sometime we could do that down the road. They separated those two. But it should never really. And the one group that still does not do that are the Coptic Orthodox, the Egyptians. I, I know an Egyptian man, and I asked, we met him right before Christmas, and I asked him about the 25th. Yes. Nothing. It's nothing. just another day for us. Yes. We celebrate on January 6th. Now, what's interesting, let's take it a step further. On January 6th, originally, that was the winter solstice. Yes. Today, we celebrate it on December 20th or something. But originally it was January 6th until Rome moved it to December. So when you start thinking about all this stuff, it gets confusing. All you have to remember is the main feast was January 6th, and it was the manifestation of God, and it celebrated his baptism, more importantly, than his nativity. Why would you think that baptism was celebrated and more important than when he was born? Why would there be an emphasis on the, by the church to say his baptism was more important than his nativity? Because I think the Holy Trinity was revealed. Okay, number one, the Holy Trinity was revealed at uh, Theophany, which was not the case when he was born. Yeah. And more importantly, he would, when he was born, did many people know? Oh, no. No. But he had 30 years. Um. And John was preaching, and suddenly, here he is. So it was, he, it's important he was born that he became incarnate, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but more importantly was the fact he was baptized, and that began his ministry. That began his ministry with one word, which was what? Repent. repent. Yeah. Just like John the Baptist had one word, repent. Christ began his ministry with one word. Okay, oh, yes, Sandra. What age was he? 
baptized then? Uh, approximately 30. 30, 30. Yeah, he only had three years of ministry mm -hmm. when you think about it. Wow. And it's hard. I don't know how you feel, but I, I get, um, what would you say, an inferior complex. When I read about these people who have accomplished so much in their life when they, and they die when they're 40 or 50, and I feel like I could go, I could go on for a hundred and still not do what I need to do. So it, it's amazing what how God has blessed people to do what they can in the short period of time that they have on this life. You know, it's amazing. Okay, the next thing. D, what is the significance of the duck? Remember that we saw, in, let me show you a picture of the, uh, an icon of the baptism. This one happens to be... It was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Revelation. But what we're going to talk about here, let me point it out first. <clears throat> let me get the exact uh, icon I want to show you. I'll try, I'll try to show it too to the people at home, but I doubt if I'll be able to uh, make that happen as easily. <laughs> You have an icon? Oh, okay. Let me uh, see if I can find the one I'm looking for here. Ah, I'm sorry. I must have brought the wrong book. Okay. Let me uh, try to portray in the icon. In the icon, you have <clears throat> Jesus being baptized in what river? Jordan. The Jordan River. Who is on uh, one side of him? Moses, I think. No. No. John, Who, John the Baptist. John the on the other side are three Angel. angels. Angels. All right. And then you see coming down from heaven. And, um, oh, I wish I had that one. The dog. The dog. The dog okay. Yeah. Yeah. But what is nice on this other icon that I wanted to show you. For some reason, I thought it was in this book. I guess I didn't bring it. Hold on one more time. I'm going to give it one more chance. Ah, oh, there it is. Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> Take a look at this. This is a 16th century Russian icon. Okay. You see the three angels? You see John the Baptist? Yeah. Now, I don't know... I'm going to try and show it in a minute for those of you on Zoom. Is I'm going to ask a question about what you see here. Bill, see if you could hold this up. As we're going to have to stand up and <laughs> can you see? Uh, and let me come around. I don't know if I can uh, do this or not. I'll try and show you the icon we're looking at. No. Oh. Okay, do you see that icon, everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. What does it look like, the black area around Christ? A chasm? Yeah, a chasm. I would say two things. One... It could look like the cave in which he was born. More importantly, it looks more like a tomb. It looks like a tomb in a sense. All right. And then you can see up on the top, the dove coming down. Now, the dove, again, is the dove the Holy Spirit? Yes. 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 No, no, it represents the Holy Spirit. It represents. All right, has anybody seen the Holy Spirit? No. 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 And so that's why you will see the form and you see, how do you know the Father's there? Do you see him? The voice. Yeah. The voice. What does he say? Yeah. My beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So you see the Trinity involved. Now, what is the significance of the dove? To the Jews, it was a sacred bird. It was a sacred bird. And it symbolized certain things. Peace is the first one. Gentleness is the second one. Purity is the third. And innocence. Very good. Very good. Yes. I went to 
you catch the interpret for the first time this year. Yes, yeah, good. I've never been before, but wow. we're right across from the church when the uh, procession came out, like the girl holding the dove. She was holding the dove. Yes. In front of the church, and she had to hold that for a while. Yes. Before they walked down. You're right. And actually threw the cross. Yes. Probably another 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, yeah, it's hard to that's hard to hold, hold a dove. Yeah. You know what happened uh, recently to uh, uh, when I served, uh, oh, especially in St. Petersburg, we would go to this one uh, funeral home. And uh, because it was outside when they had, uh, it was uh, like when you could have, what do you call it, a mausoleum where you could put people uh -huh. into the, what they had, the tradition there was a man who would offer a few words at the end of the service and he would release the dove. And I always thought that was very nice. Yes. What if you were there? What? Well, how would you interpret that for somebody who had just passed away? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. like the soul going to heaven, peace. You know, the person's at peace now. The soul's at peace. You know, the dove is pure and soaring up in the heights. I thought that was interesting, and I, I always liked what he did there. I thought it was pretty nice. Okay, most importantly, what did the dove represent? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to page 1553, all right, which is 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. 1533, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Yeah, part of <laughs> 1 5 Five three. These pages are very thin. Yes, they are. <laughs> okay, chapter two, verses, and we're going to read nine to uh, ten there. It says here, but it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of god so when we hear about the holy spirit it is very important as we talked about last week when you feel the holy spirit guiding you or urging you to do something it's important to act on it it's important to act on it whenever there was important things when mary uh, gabriel announced to mary we hear about the spirit being there. And if you go through the entire Bible and just underline every time you see Holy Spirit or spirit, you'll understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, any other questions on the baptism, on the baptism of Jesus? He did not have to be baptized. He fulfilled the law. He, and the Trinity was um, there. And also the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, now let's go on. We're going to go through this quickly, Denise. If you would read the genealogy beginning there with uh, verse 23, and we're going to go uh, through <coughs> the end of the chapter. We'll go back, brother. We'll go back uh, yeah, back to page 1369, 1369. Okay. Uh, Luke 3, beginning with verse 23. Okay. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jana, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Nahum, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Semea, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Joannes, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheiltel, the son of Nerai, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joseph, the son of Eleazar, the son of Jorim, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Eliakim, the son of Eliah, the son of Menon, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. There's the one we remember, David. The son of Jesse, the son of Obed, 
the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serub, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxat, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Wow. Read that. What, what, what was the fifth name? No. <laughs> was that your assignment for the whole day today? <laughs> he never didn't even tell me. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because there is another Sunday in the church here before a certain holy day um, that we hear Matthew, not Luke, but Matthew give a genealogy. Does anybody remember before which major feast day that's done? It's about two Sundays or one Sunday before. Christmas. Very good. Right before Christmas, before the Nativity of Christ, you have the Sunday of the Forefathers, and you'll hear Matthew going through. Now, take out the uh, <clears throat> sheet that we uh, send out, the genealogy of Jesus. All right. Now, there is a reason that all this was done. Same way with Matthew when he has his genealogy. If you look at the top, it says genealogy of Jesus. Then I want you to go down. If you, well, and we're asking here on the question and answer 3A. Luke follows which line? Well, Matthew follows whose line? Look at the bottom of the handout on genealogy. And under Luke, whose genealogy is it of? Mary. Mary. So Luke follows Mary's line. While Matthew follows whose line? Joseph. Joseph. Okay. Or Jesus too. But Joseph. Now Matthew is writing primarily. Who did Matthew write primarily to? Gentiles. Opposite. The Jews? Jews. Oh, my Matthew Luke was to the, the Jews. Luke was to the Gentiles. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's the answer to the next one. Matthew is writing primarily to the Jews. While Luke is writing to the Gentiles. Luke had to show that Jesus was fully what? Born of a virgin, full of emotions, feelings, personal, day-to-day -day experiences, fully just man. like any other. Fully man. fully man. Fully human. That's the point Luke is making here. That's why he's going down a different genealogy. Matthew has to show something different. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He has to show that he's related back to the Jewish ancestry, whereas Luke wants to show that he was... For all people. So here we go. D. Matthew placed great emphasis on pure lineage. An impure lineage deprived the Jew of his nationality. Of his right to be called a Jew. And tragically this meant that he lost his right to be called a what of God? Son, Son or child of God. Yet yeah, you lost that right. So genealogy. Son or child of God. Genealogy for the Jews was very important. Matthew traces Joseph's line to Abraham. Look up there where you see Matthew. And you see he stops at Abraham. The founder, founder, and founding father of Israel to show that Jesus had the legal right to the throne of David and to the promises made to Abraham. So if you follow it through under Matthew's gospel, there in the genealogy, you see Joseph, Solomon, David, and then Abraham. Now, one, uh, let me read on there. This meant that Jesus was legally the pure line of the Jewish nation. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies that said the Messiah would be born of the Jewish nation. And secondly, as a Jew as, and as the son of God, he had the legal right to messiahship he had the right to the throne of david and to the promises of abraham that's why jesus was often called the son of david 
So when you hear son of David, it's because they wanted to show that he had the legal right to the lineage right back to David. Yes, Dora. He calls himself son of man. A man too, both. So they're both in the in the scripture, son of man, son of David. He's it, obviously when he says the son of man, he's showing the human nature yeah. of, of that aspect. Okay, in E, the genealogies of both Matthew and Luke are not complete. In other words, if you went back, you'd find out there are a lot of names missing here. There are a lot of names missing. Can you imagine if they were all here? <laughs> It'd be hard to read. Nor do they list every single descendant. There are gaps. There are variations of both genealogies. Now, this gets interesting. To the Liberate marriage. According to the principle of the Liberate marriage in ancient Israel, if a man died without children, his what would marry the widow? Brother. The brother. The brother would marry the widow and raise up a descendant for his deceased brother. The firstborn son of this marriage would be counted as the heir of the deceased man and would inherit the property. Now, I read some commentary. It gets very interesting. I did not put it on here. I'm not going to confuse you. But it gets interesting where, all right, let's say you have a husband and a wife married. And they have a son. The husband dies. The brother marries the wife. They have children and a firstborn son. Can you imagine the problems no. there with <laughs> the no. inheritance, etc.? Okay, let's go up. Luke traces Jesus' ancestry. Look at the top of there. It, it doesn't go back to Abraham, but it goes back to whom? Adam. 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 The son of God, unlike Matthew, who only traces Christ's ancestry back to Abraham. This is because, whereas Matthew was writing with the eye toward the Jews and had as his main concern the portrayal of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, Luke was writing for a Gentile audience and was concerned to portray Jesus as the savior of the entire world. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's coming for everybody. Everybody now has a chance to be part of God's chosen. That is why Luke traces Jesus back to Adam, the forefather of all men, and to God who created Adam. By doing this, Luke emphasizes that Jesus came to be the savior of all Adam's descendants. It's, again, if you read this, I don't know about you, but as Denise was reading, after a while, you know, one name becomes like another, and you wonder, who are these people, etc. But there is a message for all of it, and that's the more important thing. Not to remember the, necessarily the names as why was Matthew doing this and why was Luke doing that? And well, the good thing about it is if, if we were to say, hey, which one do, would you rather read, what would your answer be? There's no right answer, so, so don't worry. Luke. Luke. Why? Because he believes that Jesus came for everybody, not just the Jews. You feel good as a Gentile saying, I like this man. I like the Luke. You know, he made me one of his own, you know, etc. So, all right. Any other questions? We're not going to spend any more time. Yes, yeah, Ekaterini. The question is, we know about Solomon that he was David's son. Mm -hmm. But is Nathan one of his sons or is this one of his, uh, like the priest? Uh, the one David. here? From the, from the genealogy. From David, oh, yeah, David, David Solomon. Luke's, uh, in Luke's yeah. genealogy, is one of his sons? Yes. Okay, it's yeah. not one of the priest method. No, no, in this case, it would be the son. Okay. Jump. Yes. Is Luke right? Is it in the gospel, like in the church on a Sunday? Or Luke is read, but not one of the problems. I don't go off and tend to too much, but it always gets me. Mm -hmm. This, you will not hear this one. Mm -hmm. You will not hear this passage read in the church. And one of the problems we have in North House Church, not a problem. It's very good. The church fathers did it for a reason. Every year you have the same reading for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's good because then you know what's coming. It prepares you for the feast. The problem is we never read the rest of the Bible. Yeah, right. And so unless you're reading it at home, mm -hmm. and that's why even with preaching sometimes, I'd much rather, after you've preached as a priest on a Zacchaeus for the last five, six, seven years, sometimes you say to yourself, let me talk about something else. You know, there's a lot like, and where do you get these questions? In the Bible study, people say, Father, what about this? What about that? I think we need to start <clears throat> opening it up to where people give input and say, can you give a sermon on and fill in the blank? Yeah. Now, again, I'm speaking just as 
a person here individually, not as uh, the church. Okay. So anyway, that's that's my belief on it. So no, the answer to you okay. this specifically is not right. By the way, would that go against any? You wouldn't want to do it every week, right. all right? You want to keep to, we have a lectionary. Now, in the Protestant church and, and in the Roman Catholic, to a certain extent, they have what they call lectionary A, B, and C. And so every year it changes. They'll, they'll start with A, then they'll go to the next year, B, B, and then C. Then they repeat again. So they still have, and the liturgical churches, Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Orthodox, will have the same feast every year, nativity, baptism, annunciation. So you're going to get the same readings, whereas you go into a typical Protestant church and the average Protestant minister will speak about whatever he wants. As, as the spirit moves him or her, you know, to be honest with you. So um, it is what it is. All right. All right. Enough with the uh, genealogy. I thought it was interesting, though, because when you look at it, you know, you would think that, all right, genealogy, you go all the way back. But no, they had their differences even there, and it was for a reason. All right, let's go on to four. We have a lot to cover here. Elena, if you don't mind reading chapter four, verses one through four. We're going to get into the temptation now. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice again, was led by whom? The Spirit. Go ahead. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Then Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Okay, very good. All right, let's go back here to the question and answer. A, 4A, what is the significance of Jesus in this situation, as well as other ascetics, ascetics meaning those monks, nuns who go off on their own, going into the wilderness? What do you get out of going into the wilderness? Solitude. Solitude? What else? You to pray? What else? Why the wilderness stuff? You don't have the uh, distractions. No distractions. You don't have the worldly things, etc. So now, that could be good. But when could it be challenging? Well, the devil gets in there. The devil was going to play mind games with you. The devil will play mind games. Now, this is good about why there's so much emphasis on meditation today and spending quiet time, time alone. I would say when you start to pray, try to remain silent before you start a prayer. Try to remain silent. And tell me, in fact, between now and next week, in case I forget, one of you remind me. Between now and next week, when you say your prayers in the morning or at night, in the afternoon, whenever, put yourself silently. I would suggest closing your eyes, although that's not necessary, but I think this way you're not going to be distracted even by looking at a door or whatever. I do. And tell me how long you're able to do that. All right, I don't need an answer tonight. Think about that for next week. Without any thought, you mean? Or you just... could have, I, I'd rather you not have a thought. The idea is to put yourself in a, a period okay. where you're at peace and you're at silence uh -huh. and you are almost like oh. in a, a neutral state yeah. to where when you start to pray, you start to engage Christ, then you're going to see a difference. But, but try that. And tell me, and, and be honest, be honest. Uh, when you start off, I, you know, we're not going to have a lot of long periods of time. <laughs> I, was, I was reading, Father. Yeah. Talk up so they can hear you. I was reading on the computer, my phone, I don't yes. remember. The life of St. Anthony. Yes. He was a hermit. Hermit, right. The father yeah. of all monks, by yes. the way, yes. But this temptation we're talking about here, he was tempted like, Oh my yes. gosh. Yes. Yes. He was tempted. And that's the point is the more you try to go into this, and let's go on here. It says, we can call the wilderness a, which is an image of the world, both the dwelling place of demons and a source of divine tranquility and victory. It is a battleground. It is a battleground. Yeah. That's why I said, and what Nancy just said, you are going to have experienced peace, and then you're going to be tempted. 
you're going it's going to be very difficult because the devil's going to come after you why will the devil want to come after you because he wants you he wants you in other words here's somebody trying to get close to god to christ and so if you're trying that he's going to even want to work hard i'm going to read the note down there on four one the exodus of jesus into the wilderness following his baptism has a dual symbolism one it fulfills the old testament type in which israel journeyed in the wilderness for 40 years after its baptism in the red sea and two, it prefigures our own journey through the fallen world after baptism as we struggle towards the kingdom. After you're baptized, I always tell people, be prepared, just like I say that after confession. Be prepared. Sorry. Just turn it off if you would, Nancy. Okay. okay. I would ask that uh, uh, after uh, baptism or after confession, be prepared that the devil is going to attack. The devil is going to attack. And anybody who's coming closer, you have to be prepared for the spiritual warfare. Now, what Old Testament D, man communed with God on Mount Horeb for 40 days in Deuteronomy 9-9, just as Christ communed with the Father for 40 days? Take a guess, it begins with an M. Moses. 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 He received the Ten Commandments, and he communed with Notice there, communed with the Father. See, did I miss it? Christ allows the devil to tempt him to fulfill his own purposes. Purposes, I'm sorry. To fill his own purposes. The strengthening of Christ and his own people. Now, but the other person who did that was Moses. All right. Now, next page, three. Why was it necessary for Christ to face demonic temptation in all its power? I mean, before we read, I'll read the Hebrews, but tell me what you think. Why was it important or necessary, actually, for Christ to face demonic temptation in all of its power? To show that he was stronger or higher than the devil. Okay. Number one, to show that he had power over the devil. What else? That's what I wanted to say. Yep, same thing. He wanted to show his power. Power. Over him. As God or as a man? As man. As because man. In other words. He is both. Yeah. If it were just God, then there's like saying. You already have the power. You already have the power. But as man, what does that say to you and me? It's that we can. We, we, can, we can do the same thing. Yeah. You see the beauty about that? That's why it's difficult to say then, the devil made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Barkley. Not, not only that, he went into that battle, starved half to death. All right, now we're going to talk about that. He went into the battle, starved half to death. All right, and that, we're going to talk about that. That's a very good point there that, that comes up. All right, let me read Hebrews uh, 2. Verses uh, 17 and 18. Again, we're just talking about uh, why it was necessary for Christ. It says here, therefore, in all things, all things, he had to be made like his brethren, human, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to to aid those who are tempted. That's why if people say, who can identify with me? It's always Christ. And that's why anytime you go through anything in your life and you say, gee, other people have it bad, but I have it the worst. No, Christ had it the worst. And yet he identified through all of the things that we go through, and he's saying to us, I will give you the strength, just have faith and trust in me. And that's one thing we should never lose, is to have that faith and trust in Christ, regardless of what we're going through. All right. Why do you think, the F, the devil's first temptation, oh, wait, let, let, do we have to read that? Or no, no, we did. Why did we, you think the devil's first temptation to Christ dealt with hunger? Why was it important no, to start the basic yeah, like need? Yeah, yeah, we did, but I'm asking the question. Now. It's a basic need. It's a basic need. All right. And what happens when you get hungry? 
Do we not need? We only get up to verse four. Yeah, weak. Yeah, it says man shall not live by bread alone. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Okay. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> okay, so going back to Bill, what you said, uh, you it, when you get hungry, it makes you weak. How do what does it do to you spiritually? Yeah. You weaken. You lose faith. Okay, well then why do we say fast? To they concentrate on get, reaching back to Christ. Eventually, yeah. eventually, what happens when you fast truly? Oh, rise above it. Louder. We rise above it. We rise above it. Eventually, when you fast properly, think of this before you go in for a surgery or anything else. They'll tell you what you can and cannot do, or this or that. We talked about this many times. You're supposed to fast before you receive communion. Uh, how many times do we say, gee, I'd love to have a cup of coffee in the morning. On Sundays, I don't miss it. Because I, you discipline your body that you don't think about. It's a mental thing as much as it is physical. It's psychological as much as it is, is physical. But eventually, it's like working out or going to a gym daily. You will eventually be able to have uh, go on the... Bicycle for, you know, instead of 10 minutes, it'll be 20. Before you know it's 30. Before you know it's 40. The cardio will be there. Eventually, you're going to do better, whether it's food or exercise or anything else. So you start to have the mind over matter. Because initially, let's be honest. The first thing that most of us, especially in America, get up and think about, what am I going to have for breakfast? And now, by the way, halfway through the morning, we're thinking about what? Lunch. And then uh, before you know it, <laughs> it's, if you talk to those people, how many people will say it? My life centers around food. Yeah. It, it really does for a lot of people. Yeah. And so you realize that what he, happens here is this is why fasting is important. Jesus fasted. And he, again, for various reasons, as we've talked about, but it is very important. What is the benefit of our own fasting? We just talked about that there. Now, I will read uh, Deuteronomy 8. In all of these three temptations, he will always refer to Deuteronomy, the Old Testament book. That's why it's important to know back... Um, Wait, who is he will always refer to? Uh, Luke, Luke, oh, uh, the Luke. gospel writer. The gospel writer will always refer, and in this case, Jesus too, because Jesus is answering him. He's answering the devil. So uh, Deuteronomy, I'm going to read chapter 8, verses 2 uh, to 5. And listen carefully, and you'll see how this ties in. It says here, I'll start with one. Every commandment I command you today, you must be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and inherit the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Now you shall remember the whole way the Lord your God led you in the desert to deal harshly with you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he dealt harshly with you and weakened you with hunger and fed you with what did he give them uh, when uh, they didn't have banking? Manna. manna. And fed you with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might m make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeding from the mouth of God, man shall live. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your feet become callous these 40 years. Um, let me finish the fifth verse there. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son to, so the Lord your God chastens you. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for all this. There's a test, that, and he's allowing the devil to come and test him. All right? He's going to show he's fully God, fully man, <laughs> and so that we can identify with him. All right, let's go on. Uh, Angela, if you read 5 through 8. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So what's he trying to tell him here? That he can have all. He can have it all. So what, what do you get if you can have it all? What do you get? Power. Power. Power, authority, power, authority. Now, I put a note here. Matthew lists this as a third one. 
There's a switch here. There's a switch. Luke is going to list this one as number two, but Matthew will list it as number three. And I, I like Matthew better because after we read the next one, I'll explain why. Okay, now this becomes the, uh, the next, the, the 5A. Um, in what city did he take him here? When it says uh, in verse, what was it? By taking up him, taking him up on a high mountain. What city was that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All right. Now, the words rendered worship. Notice it says here, you shall worship the Lord your God and whom him only you shall serve. There's two words there, worship and serve. In Greek, proskinio, is that how you pronounce it? Proskinio. Proskinio. And letrevo. letrevo. The verb for um, wor uh, worship, or excuse me, for proskinio uh, means to bow down. And in this context, to bow down in total submission. That's why we call during Lent to make a prostration. Or we call it in Greece, Edafier, Edafier, both, oh. like they do in the realities. Yes. That is Edafier prostration. So, in other words, it's showing the humility. You're bowing down, showing the humility. And then the verb, letrevo, means to serve in the sense of performing religious studies, especially liturgical ones. Thus, it is usually translated as to worship. This is where you get the difference between to whom do we worship? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What do we offer to the Virgin Mary and the saints? Do we worship them? No. Revere. Reverence, <laughs> honor. Reverence and honor. All right. But this is the difference here. This is the Greek word here. Worship is only for God. This is very important. Very important to make here. Okay. Now. How ourselves ever tempt God? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> that was a quick answer. <laughs> you want to expound on that one? <laughs> how, how do we, how do we uh, tempt God? How do we tempt him? In what way? <laughs> uh, how, how would we tempt God? How do we tempt God? Okay, disobeying his commandments, Elena. The sin. Yeah, in other words, he created us to be in his image and like this. We don't always listen to him. So we, in essence, go against him. We, and, and what are we tempting when we say we tempt him? What do we expect to happen? Yeah, in other words, the question becomes... I'm doing this. Are there going to be consequences? Yeah. Yes. All right. But we hope that he will what? Forgive. Forgive us. There is that fine line between we tempt him on a daily basis because of sin. And yet at the same time, we know that he's a forgiving, loving God. And he said, oh, Lord, I should have done that. Why did I do that? Please forgive me. And then the next day we get up and what do we do? Start all over again. <laughs> You know, it's very, it's, it's frustrating, but this is uh, what happens uh, with this. All right, uh, going on there. D, does God ever tempt us? No. Does God tempt us? Go ahead. No. no, no, why not? Why not, Ekaterina? I'm going to put up a, go ahead. We have free will. Okay, we have free will. When you think of who would tempt us, though, who yeah, would? Devil. The devil. Yeah. So when you think of temptation, you think of positive or negative? Negative. 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 Okay, so the devil will tempt, all right? God, Christ, will uh, allow it in order to what? Like a scarf. Grow, test us. There's a difference. There's a difference. The devil will tempt us, not God, not Christ. But Christ will allow it as a test for us to what you said, Marcos, to grow. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. And I only know part of the answer. If we pray for, for patience... It doesn't come easy. No, 
in fact, no. we get tested royally. Correct. I, I, I correct about that sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And Marcos said, you know, if we pray, for example, for patience, what usually follows? <laughs> you will have experiences to yeah. learn patience. Right. You, it's not like you say, send down the P word, you know, uh, patience, you know, and engulf me with it. It doesn't work out. It's going to give you opportunities, maybe at a lower level, to learn. And then it's almost like saying, well, gee, how did I? And that's why it's important to say, at the end of the day, how did I do today? Yeah. Because if you don't assess how you're doing, you could, you know, not even know if you're gaining patience or not. You're going to say something. No, that's why, but actually, I said something. Yeah. We well, I, I thought there was more you were going to say. <laughs> when I lost my patience, I said something that I need to apologize. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you lose your patience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let me read here just as so you understand about uh, temptation versus testing. James has, uh, and please, if somebody asks you about can God tempt, go right to James. Go right to James. All right. It's going to be chapter one, verses 12 to 15. Um, it's on page 1674. If you want to follow, I'm going to read it. Uh, 12 to 15. And it's a section on temptation. Page 1674, chapter 1 of James. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Notice that word endurance. Where else? Remember times we heard that so often? For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. It's very clear there. Very clear, very direct. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Always go back to James if somebody says, oh, God's tempting me. No, it's the devil tempting you, but God's allowing it. It could be a test, and you're to learn something from it. Any comments or any questions on that? All right, moving right along. To whom originally, uh, oh, well, let me read one more. I, I wanted to read the note there, I think, too. I didn't read the note. B, I have part B to my question, too. I'm sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry? I have a part B to my Oh, yeah. <laughs> Too late. Well, <laughs> after I read the note, okay. I lost patience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning to be patient with you. <laughs> <laughs> See? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you only get one letter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good to laugh. All right. Let me read the note down there um, on page 1674. Uh, for that uh, section there. It says, uh, where did I want to read? 12 to 15 is what I read. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Wait a minute. One. <clears throat> James. Oh, I'm on a two. I want to be on one. Okay. 12 to 15. Okay. It says there 12. We are to rejoice even in temptations. They reveal whether or not we are prepared for heaven. Ooh. That's strong that is strong and so let's be honest if if you're trying to live a good life and you're trying to follow the commandments of god and you're trying to do your best <clears throat> praying scripture reading worshiping you expect your life to go how good smoothly and it always doesn't and so notice what happens and then you're in a dilemma the, the dilemma is well, what did I do wrong, God? And then we go through this questioning. What did I do wrong? What do I need to do now? Why are you doing this to me? I'm trying my best. What do you expect? You see what, and, and what happens when you start playing that game, where does it lead you? Yeah. Bad. Down a dead, bad path. Down a bad, you get into a depression. You get into a depression. And it's almost like you have to be very careful because, you know, if you keep going, the devil's having fun. Yeah. The devil's playing with you. Yeah. He's tempting you, and you're going down that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he'll destroy. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcos, your part B, the question. <laughs> well, you answered part of it already, but uh, back in 2003, I said a prayer, and I know God answered it. 
Uh -huh. I mean, he said it, the first couple of words was to that answer. I know he spoke to me and said, be patient. Be patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. That means he's maybe given me the ability to be patient, but I, I fall short. So when, yeah. so when I, I, I've heard this by many such as just priests and yeah. say, pray for patience, you're going to be tested. Yes. It right. makes me afraid to pray for it. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Then I, I, I know I need it. But how are you going to grow if you don't? So yeah. I guess my part B was to say, okay, is there some hope that we don't have to go back to scratch every time we ask for patience? Right. Do right. we have some yes. growth? Yes. Uh, and yeah. And, and I think the answer is yes. I I would hope, I don't know about you, but let's substitute the, uh, another sin, anger, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, foul easy. mouth. Mm -hmm. You go down the line and you could say to yourself, any sin I've committed, have you grown? Mm -hmm. Have I learned patience to, you know, keep, that, that's keep easier to measure in, yes. our, in ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well. But patience, for example, you can ask yourself, how, how often do I fly off the handle? How often yeah. do I have to get my own way? How often do I, you see what I'm saying, is that there's different ways of measuring it. What you know yourself is you can sense in yourself whether you're patient or not. You may not want to admit it, but we all can generally say, for example, if somebody is speaking and you seem to be always finishing the words that they're saying or something like that, that's not a good sign for patience. It's almost, and it comes down to control. I think I'm on to something here right now. It's something I have learned before, and I forget it all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm stupid. <laughs> Join the club. Go ahead. And that is, I need to pray ahead. Yes, yes. So when yeah. my patience is tested, I'm not cut off. I'm not blindsided. Right, right. That's what is yeah I, I, when so when i forget to do the simplest things like that yeah i'm being ignorant yeah there are things that if you know you're going to a situation and experience you're going to have an encounter with somebody and that would be the thing you do you want to pray ahead of time there are other times you're not going to have that luxury you're going to be in a conversation something's going to come up and you're going to feel like i need to respond to it so that's where you have to start weighing it out but what you said is important Start to pray about it. And most importantly, I always say, always add at the end, thy will be done. Mm. If you can say, I like this, but in any case, no matter whether I have the patience or whether I don't, to the extent that you wanted me to, let your will be done. So that I can discern it then. So I know that this is your will, not mine. Yes. <clears throat> so that we are, instead of reacting, we're choosing our response right exactly and it's, it's don't be a reactor but be an actor try to take it events e to whom originally had god given authority to rule the world adam and eve adam and eve when they fell into sin that sovereignty was forfeited to the tempter all right now we hear different words for satan the devil and once one of them is he's the prince of darkness, darkness. darkness. and other times we'll hear him as the ruler of this world. Mm. Because once Adam and Eve sinned, and we all now pay the consequences of sin, do we have control over what he gave us to have control over? No. 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 Well, so who has stepped in? The devil. The devil. And so now... There's the fight. There's the fight. We relinquished our responsibility. So the devil slid right in. Very interesting. Then. Okay. Let's read, uh, Sandra, if you don't mind, 9 to 12, verse chapter 4, 9 to 12. No, I went over the two Corinthians. So. Oh, take your time. Take your time. <laughs> She's on an iPhone, so we have to wait for her. To... <laughs> yeah. Take your time, we're not in a hurry. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. 
and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Read the uh, 13th also. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Okay, in the third temptation of Jesus, the <laughs> devil says, if you are the son of God, then you can expect what basically from the father? What will the father do? Protect you. Protection. If you are, then let's see. It. Because the father should protect you, so jump off, and I'm sure the angels will come and get you, okay? You know, this, I, I yes. just like to point out, I think it's interesting that the devil, when he's trying to tempt him, he's not using his own words. Very you know, good. He's using scripture. Yeah. Very so good. he really knows yeah. scripture very well, and he can just quote it like that. Who does that sound like? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, what what we have to be careful of that actually that is a, an extremely important point. The devil will use what he needs to use against yeah. each of us. Like that's sneaky, and that's, that's sneaky. sneaky. In other words, he's saying to God, to your Christ, yeah. he's reversing the role. Yeah. He's doing exactly what you said. I'm going to use your own words against you, and that's what you have to be careful of. He will take whatever he needs to, to get at each and every one of us. We all have that Achilles heel. He knows how to attack each and every one of us. All right, this temptation B <clears throat> was a temptation to find security against a life's what? In advance and to be spared the uncertainty that comes from walking with God by faith. It is the perennial temptation to presume on God's care and to bend his will to ours. Life's suffering. Um. This is a big thing. Yeah. This is why we say, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, the devil loves to say, basically, I'm going to tempt you. Just like I said before, you're trying to do your best, and yet things don't always go the way you'd like them. And the suffering. devil's smiling. So it's against life's suffering. And what he's basically saying, if, there, if you are God, then why is there suffering in the world? Mm -hmm. If you are God, why should I leave you this? And another here, I have a question about it. Yes. And he divided from him until an opportune time. Let's get into that. I'm going on to the next oh, page. Oh, 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 yeah, oh. thanks. See, does Christ debate, does the Christ debate with the devil on this temptation? No. 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 He simply responds with what? Another, another scripture. Yeah. Another scripture. In other words, I'm going to fight you with your own. That's the old question about, you know, how do you answer a question by asking a question? And it's very interesting. So Christ is still one step ahead, always, yeah. of the devil. Now, it says there, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Um, how do we ourselves try to bend God's will to ours? What do we do to try to get God to do what we want instead of saying, thy will be done? Rationalize. Rationalize. The first thing we do is explain that a little more, uh, Bill. What do you mean by rationalize? Make excuses. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> make excuses. That's good. We make excuses. How else do we do it? We bargain. I'm sorry? Minimize. Minimize. Very important. What else? Twist it. Twist it. Very good. Sounds like you guys have some experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone had an answer. <laughs> <laughs> we twist it. What else? Yeah. I have a good one, but I'll wait for you. We're experts at this. We're experts at this. <laughs> All right. Tassie wants to say something. Tassie? We bargain. That's what I was thinking. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. That's a big one. Very good. That, that one to me is... Oh, yes. Who else? I'm sorry? Evade. E evade? Yeah. Very good. Very good. We evade situations. 
or evade coming to Christ, or evade repenting, or all these are the way we barter. But especially with bargaining, if you allow me to get this promotion, if you allow me to get well, if you, I'll come and I'll do this. You see? And then when you think about it, whether we, this is the beauty, beauty about faith. In the end, all these things go away. If you have faith in the end, although there's a struggle because you're not going to get there, like you were saying, you have to just work on it. You grow in faith. And in the end, you're going to praise him and thank him and glorify him, regardless of whether you get what you want or not. That's when you made it. Is when you can say, Lord, whether you heal me or whether you give me this promotion or whether this, I'm going to still trust in you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to have faith in you. And I still want your will to be done. And that takes experience and it takes struggle against the devil. It takes suffering too. And suffering. And suffering. Not to minimize that by any means. Did the devil give up when Christ did not give in to his three temptations? No. Did he go away? No. He went, well, what does it say there? He departed, right? He departed, but did he did he give up? No. No. What's now your question, Nancy? Yes. Opportune time was it? Well, yeah, then opportune time. What does that mean? It was in the opportune time when Jesus was praying in the garden. Even before that. What was the opportune time that he really injected himself? Judas. Judas. Judas betrayed. That's when the devil waited for that opportune time. He got Judas, one of the chosen 12, and the opportune time was then. And then the rest, as we say, is history. Okay. We're going to stop there. Yeah, he's tricky. The devil is tricky. Yeah, Sandra? It's kind of a stupid question, but no, I mean, the devil is a fallen angel. I mean, where's the, where's, what's yeah, that's a, that is that is what devil? is believed. Like, if you look at any catechism and so forth, and you ask who is Lucifer, etc. First of all, I mean, when did he pull, pull the yeah, mm -hmm. if you look at God when he created, even before the earth and all, anything he created, could it could he have created evil? No, no, because he is God of love. So no. he created angels and so forth. It is believed that one of the angels wanted to be God or like God. And he fell from grace along with others that went with it. And so that's the origin. Everything God created was good and perfect. But because of, again, the pride the sin of pride, to go and say, I don't want to be a creature. I want to be like the creator. Then there was the fall. That's the fall. Uh, fall of, <clears throat> out of grace, shall we say. Then you have the fall, of course, of Adam and Eve after in paradise. That's a good question, though. In fact, we could... That's referenced in the Bible somewhere. Yes. Think, right, just very briefly. E briefly, yes. And we could... Uh, <laughs> It's someone who makes his angels spirits in his ministry and other things. But, but uh, we can look at that sometime. I don't want to spend too much time on the devil, don't get me sure. wrong. But, <laughs> but it is good to know who the adversary is. It's good to know who the adversary is. Good. Yes, Marco? You know, Father, um, right now, we're, a lot, we're seeing a lot of spiritual warfare across the world. Right. A lot of very bad things happening. Right. I wanted to tell you. Yeah. What we've all been told will happen in the latter days. Yes. I'm seeing a lot of false prophets. A lot of false prophets, on, yes. Online. Online, yeah. And for people that don't have any faith. Yes. Yeah. Christian mm -hmm. connections. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them are getting quite a following. What's going to happen? Uh, and what, one of the books. I was thinking of going into after we finish because we may want to stop right now with this with Luke. Mm -hmm. I did the bat the nativity and I did the baptism and the presentation, 
because it followed in where we were in the liturgical cycle. What I was thinking of doing now, because it, he's going to go on to now to, to some of the miracles and so forth. So it's going to uh, be a little different. I mean, the what I was looking at is the book of Daniel. And the reason the book of Daniel is it has to do a lot with what you talked about, the book of Revelation and the end of times. So let me take a look at that. And I'm leaning more toward that right now, because I think we could talk about a lot of things. And uh, there's some good uh, doctrine in there. There's some good um, stories, you know, with the, the three youths and so forth. But I think that we may want to look at that. Uh, so unless, I, I, again, please, I got some input on topics you guys suggested, but please give me more if you'd like. But right now I'm leaning toward Daniel, uh, where we are, because a lot of people are talking about this in the times yeah. and the way things are in the world today and so forth. And we may want to take a look at that. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right, then let's end with the prayer, please. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord, our God, that again on this occasion, you have opened our eyes to the light of your wisdom. You have gladdened our hearts with the knowledge of truth. We entreat you, Lord, help us always to do your will. Bless our souls and bodies, our words and deeds. Enable us to grow in grace, virtue, and good habits, that your name may be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, everybody on Zoom. Enjoy.